So, um, good afternoon. I'm Caroline Frost and I'm delighted to be hosting this panel today on behalf of the Royal Television Society. We will be looking at a brand new show, Magpie Murders, not the Magpie Murders, which I'm sure Anthony Horowitz will be very quick to correct us if we get that wrong. And there is a reason for that, which we may or may not explore without spoiling too much. So um, we have with us, I don't know if you want to just say hello to uh, Anthony Horowitz, writer, writer of the original novel and adapter for screen, producer Jill Green, uh, we have the director, Peter Cantaneo, and cast members, Leslie Manville, Daniel Mays, and Tim McMullen. So thank you very much for joining us today, all of you. We'll be discussing the show in great rich depth, hopefully, but first of all, let's just have a sneak peek at what everyone else has in store. Jamie, can we run the trailer, please? Chapter one. There were many who considered Atticus Punt to be the world's greatest detective. I had dinner with him last night. And? He's finished it. <gasps> Magpie Murders. There's no last chapter. It's missing the last chapter. A whodunit without the ending. It's not even worth the paper it won't be printed on. There's something terrible to tell you. Alan's dead. Dead? This is murder. And murder can be solved. One for sorrow, two for joy. I'm going to go to Suffolk and look for the missing pages. Three for a girl, four for a boy. He based a character on you. Five for silver, six for gold. It's his last novel. Everyone he knew was in it. Seven for a secret. That's why the last chapter was taken. Never to be told. The answer's in the book. Magpie Murders, streaming 10th of February only on Britbox. Well, as you can already hopefully be able to tell, there is plenty in Magpie Murders that we all love best about our crime drama, both in the novels and on the screen. So, Anthony, you're the perfect person to answer many of these questions. Uh, can we just take you back initially to when you first wrote the novel? Um, when was the seed planted? I believe it was quite some time before. And what were you hoping to explore that you hadn't done in all of your other work? Well, I actually had the idea for Magpie Murders about 15 years before I started writing it. And if you watch an early episode of Midsummer Murders, another double M incidentally, you'll see one of the characters in it reading Magpie Murders, because I'd thought it up, but hadn't written it, but got the book made up anyway as a prop. And the reason it took me so long to write was that it was just such a complicated idea. And I wanted to do this, you know, the idea of a murder mystery inside a murder mystery, a book inside a book, was just insanely complicated, but it can't be seen that way. People have got to enjoy it and follow it. And so just working out how to do it took me a very long time, about actually two years to do the adaptation. And what would you describe, I'm, I'm trying to be really careful not spoiling too much, but what would you describe was that moment when you saw an opening and how you might make it work? You mean for the screen? Well, well originally for the novel, but I guess, yes, for, 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 for the, the screen For the as novel, well. I mean, it was a question of just starting with the Golden Age murder mystery set in the 1950s and then finding modern reflections in that in the story of Susan Ryland. The problem with the adaptation for the TV was that having cast Leslie Manville in the role of, of, of uh, the editor, Susan, we couldn't wait until episode four for her to turn up. I don't think audiences would have been too happy. I'm not sure, but Leslie would have been either. So it was a question of how on earth do you sort of rejig it all so that the two stories, the past and the present, happen at the same time and, do and at the same time don't confuse anybody. Yes, yes. Not easier said than done, I'm sure. So, um, of course, let's just deal with the, the deliberate tropes and nods, I'm hoping, I'm guessing, admiring of other crime writers, particularly Golden Age ones. I mean, in the very first scene, I think we see Alan Conway seeking out some inspiration from Agatha Christie, no less. Were you, were you, was this a, a doffed cap to many of those writers gone by? <laughs> There are references to lots of Golden Age writers. I mean, Atticus Punt is, is I don't think there's very much a poirot in it, but there's quite a bit of Sherlock Holmes, funnily enough, sort of mm -hmm. hiding in the background there. And, and he's referenced quite a few times indeed. Mm -hmm. The writer, um, Alan Conway, lives in a house named after a Sherlock Holmes short story. Um, Dorothy L. Sayers is mentioned, I think, inside there somewhere. All of the sort of the usual suspects, you know, my, the, the writers I love, Anthony Barclay, the, all the big Golden Age writers are in some way referenced. But I hope that the actual show itself is very fresh and modern. That was the joy of it. It's having the 21st century story, uh, which sort of, you know, un you know converts or, or deconstructs the 50s story. And the 50s story told with a very slight tongue in cheek, you know, taken seriously, but at the same time with a smile. Yes. 
Um, for the sake of our members of our audience who have not had the chance yet to enjoy all of it, would you be able to give a little paragraph just as an introductory synopsis so, so we kind of know what we're dealing with here? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Leslie Manville plays Susan Ryland, an editor who has a very famous writer called Alan Conway, who has written the new novel, Magpie Murders, not, as you said, The Magpie Murders. And um, but he delivers the manuscript, it is missing the last chapter. So she travels to Suffolk to find it because unfortunately, Alan Conway is dead. And as she arrives in Suffolk, she discovers two things. One, he died of not natural causes, he was murdered. And two, the solution to his murder is almost certainly contained in the missing chapter. So that's it in a nutshell. Beautiful. Um... Jill, can I move on to you? I mean, you, you've had this discussion many a time, I'm sure. What made you realise this was the right pickings for such rich screen material? And what were your biggest challenges in taking that on? Well, we've made a lot of crime, but I have to say, I think this is the most distinctive piece we've ever made. And that's because it is the book, it's the mystery within the mystery, a book within a book. Um, and it's also got a sort of, metafiction over the top of it because it's about how writers write uh, and how they find their characters and how they might seek to revenge against people who they meet in contemporary life and then they decide to put inside a book as well so it's immensely complicated I mean as, as Anthony said um, and I think the biggest challenge which did take a long time as Anthony said two years was in the book there's a lot in 1955 and a huge number of characters involved in several murders inside that, that murder mystery and a very small amount in contemporary. And what we decided to do, a huge decision, was to flip the two over and make the, story, the contemporary story almost 70% of the drama and make Susan, if you like, our reliable narrator. Because I really felt that she needed to carry us, the audience, through all of the complexities that, that the script is presenting. Um, and that was a, a fantastic decision because it's still very, very sophisticated and for all of those murder mystery lovers, um, although I don't think anybody will get the ending, um, but it's also in the way that Anthony writes and Peter has superbly directed it, very accessible. So, and then Leslie takes us through uh, as she's living it. So I think that that the adaptation was, and then obviously delivery, uh, well, that was a whole nother <laughs> world. We had a tight budget and Peter Catania was, uh, was, was brilliant in, uh, in his vision for the show and realizing those crossovers. Well, it doesn't look as though it was filmed on a, on a shoestring at all, I think. It's all on the screen. Uh, one more question, we'll get to the casting. I have just one more question. When a book has already been so successful in the bestseller lists, does that make it easier or harder to adapt for the screen? Um, it, it depends on, on, on the author and how much, or the authoress, how much flexibility they want to give to it. It's two different entities, it couldn't yeah. be more different and this is a very good demonstration of it obviously it's the same character spiritually it's the same um maybe we're a bit more playful in tone which was a deliberate uh decision we made for for the production right up front um but yeah i mean um if it's successful that's great because it's already a brand in its own right mm -hmm. and that will you know get us a larger audience so we're always happy with that Great. Um, and of course, as you said, casting was crucial, particularly the decision to make Susan the, the, the central person through which we learn so many twists and turns. At what point mm. did Leslie come on board? Very early on. And that was so crucial for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we when we met Leslie, Anthony and I, we had one script, maybe, and uh, a, a flavour of the other episodes and the book, obviously. And we, we just knew that she was absolutely right for it and through all the challenges of getting it made um, and the adaptation she was with us the whole way she was absolutely vital to the whole whole thing and then of course it's brilliant in it so yes. on top of all that <laughs> delivers <laughs> good egg on and off screen Elizabeth, yes. um, can I turn to you at this um hopefully your blushing point um <laughs> you've done huge uh, big screen success you've had recent 
sitcom, well, sad com success with mum. What was the appeal of Magpie Murders for you? Well, the writing, really. I mean, it does always come down to that because uh, lots of other ingredients can be interesting. But if you haven't got a decent script, then you, you, it's a non-starter, really. And yeah, I met um, Anthony and Jill, as they said, a while before, and there was only one script. So I read the book, which is um, all I could think after I'd read the book was how the hell is he going to do what, what Anthony's just talked about, which is marry these two worlds successfully, because I don't know how you did it, Anthony, your, your house, whole house must have been a magpie murder spreadsheet. Um, <laughs> it was extraordinary. Um, so, and, and I was also, um, I was also hungry to do, uh, to do something like this, to do something in this vein. Um, I haven't really led anything that's like a murder mystery, what well, that is a murder mystery before. And um, I, I, I thought the whole package was very um, alluring. And obviously I, well, not obviously, I get on with Anthony, I get on with Jill, <laughs> and then they brought Peter Catania into the mix and it was all just terrific. And then what an amazing cast, right across the board so um but it does always start with the writing because mm -hmm. you know i've i'm sure everybody's seen uh well directed well acted productions on screen on stage on film but you you without good material you're lost for sure. And um, could you tell us a little bit about Susan? I found her quite unusual. Did you like her? Did you base her on anyone you knew? Uh, well, not, no, not really. But, you know, I think that um, what, what, was, what was really nice about getting to grips with her is that she's, she's, she's an unconventional woman. You know, she, she has chosen a life of independence. She's, she's chosen to be quite... Um, uh, um, um, out there with the way she presents herself. You know, she's not conforming to anything stereotypical about a woman of her age. You know, she's she's got a she's got a really good job. She's very bright. She's very smart. But she's also really interested in her car and her clothes. She doesn't want to get married. She's got this Greek lover who's. It's great, but you know, she doesn't want to live with him all the time. She doesn't want to marry him. She hasn't got children. She's sort of taken an unconventional route and I liked that. But I have to say that um, I was hugely uh, helped through that journey um, by the costume designer. Um, oh my God, and I've said her name this morning and now it's gone. Help me Annie, someone. Annie Harding. Annie Harding. Annie Harding. Annie Harding was absolutely brilliant because she, she kind of came in with these array of clothes and I, and it was a little light bulb moment. Um, and so a, a great uh, creative team mm -hmm. um, and all of those things kind of helped me to, to get Susan, Susan on the go. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 like all of, I like all of the things, the choices that we've made to make her uh, what you see on the screen. For sure, I think yes. Her her leather jacket was an essential part of, of her entire entity. I thought. I know it's good. It might have found a home somewhere. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, think it's, I think it's still looking. <laughs> Model zone. Um, Tim, can we turn to you because your character is quite unusual in this piece. He's he's kind of he's well, they're all fictional, but he's even more fictional, arguably, than the others. So, um, how did you tackle? I don't want um, your character. You can pronounce him for me properly. Atticus Punt. Thank you. I think oh, that several people, and <laughs> he gets very, I don't know if you can tell you, he gets very annoyed. People keep saying his name wrong. And uh, <laughs> so I just, these little sort of, I think there's once I managed to kind of just quietly correct someone's pronunciation. Um, uh, how did I go about it? Well, I I, I, I thought he was, um, such a wonderful character to to play uh, because he's he's a um, I have to say, actually I'm not a big reader of um, sort of that classic era um, murder mysteries so I'm I'm not 100% familiar with a lot of those characters but 
he there's something about him which for me was irresistible which is he is so humane and you know he's clearly someone who because of his background we discover that he's been in a concentration camp in Germany um uh before that um he was a policeman and uh, and then he's a refugee uh, comes to England after the war as a refugee and makes a living as a private detective and he really manages to fit in he's very successful he becomes quite quite well known um and um but because he's suffered um himself very deeply he has he has a a great sort of understanding of human suffering um, um but also um you know he's he, the suffering that he um uh, underwent was that, um, because of evil and so he he also understands evil um uh, and um or has a you know very um profound connection to it so um so all of these crimes that he's committing um, and this is how it seemed to me, and I don't be interested to see what Anthony said, is, is that he's he's sort of drawn to um, things that come out of the human condition. You know, that, that, that what happens in this story is, you know, the crime is he really manages in the, in, in the end, he, he, he um, solves it through, um, you know, um, think, recall, analyze, uh, you know, there's no such thing as a coincidence. You, you observe things, you put them together and there can only be one solution if you're ob sufficiently observant. But it's more than that. He also understands human failings. You know, we all fall. And so that's, an, that's a sort of a, a, the X ingredient that he has is that he, 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 he logically he puts everything together, but there's another thing, a kind of empathy for the human condition that 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 he that he can see things that other people can't mm -hmm. and that that to me was a, a kind of fascinating thing to try and achieve um and i thought a really an incredible piece of writing mm. he, he's much more solitary than any other character in the series isn't he mm. he's yeah he's quite, he's quite sort of bruised uh, mm. there's something quite bruised about him i think just technically where did you go for the character, for example, the accent, how did you make sure that you got that right? Um, well, I played uh, I played a German character before, actually, in the Deep Blue Sea, uh, Dr. Miller, um, and um, so I sort of drew on the German accent um, that I had. There's also I can't remember his name now. The wonderful German actor from the 30s and 40s who did he was in the Life and Death of Colonel Blimp and did a, a few uh, British films. Um, his name's gone out of my head. Um, and I watched him a bit and tried mm. to pick up his um, his voice. But the, I think also the other thing is I, I didn't want him to be too guttural. I wanted him to have quite a soft voice mm -hmm. um, uh, and quite a gentle voice. You know, I didn't want, you know, because German can be quite, quite harsh and I wanted to find a, a sort of non-harsh version. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, towards the end, I'm not going to give it away, but um, you realise, well, we realise that there's another layer, shall we say, to Atticus's name. Um, did this come as a surprise to you? <laughs> when did you spot that? And were you somewhat shocked to discover this? Um, yes, I, I try not to think about it because, <laughs> yes. um, because the thing is, you know, uh, that, 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 as you will have noticed, probably, is that, um, I, I, you know, look, Atticus also um, lives in two worlds. You know, he's, he, he exists within a piece of historical fiction. He's a, he's a fictional character within, you know, a book. But, but he also um, kind of exists um, in the modern world as well, in another incarnation, um, and, and in it, he has an awareness of his own condition as a fictional character. So, um, you know, he, 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 he's able to sort of, um, sort of understand that, comprehend that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think he's profoundly upset by the realization uh, that his, his, um, uh, his name, which he's very fond of, um, may have <laughs> <laughs> yes. kind of uh, another side to it. 
yeah. It's a great twist. Um, we've had a very helpful comment from one of our audience members, Jean Buchanan, um, saying, is the German actor that you um, were mentioning, is he Anton Diffry? Uh, um, uh, no. Oh, I tell, <laughs> you, what, I, I tell you what, while, while, um, while, while we while carry on, if you yes. ask someone All right, well, you can do your research. And I should have said, as usual, I always forget to say apologies. Anybody wanting to proffer some questions to the panel, please do throw them in the Q&A, and I'll do my best to get through as many as possible. So, Daniel, while um, Tim is doing a little bit of research, could I turn to you <laughs> and talk to you about you uh, um, alone on this panel, but not alone in the cast. You were given a double entity, two roles, Chubb and Locke. Now, one is in... Um, 1950s and one is in contemporary but they were they're kind of similar but different one's a bit dimmer and one's a bit sharper so which one did you enjoy more <laughs> oh uh, uh who do i enjoy more di chubb i would say without question i thought i hadn't played a tv detective for a while so um i needed to catch up um <laughs> indeed is the main reason why i wanted to be part of this project i mean Obviously, you've got amazing writing and actors already attached, but the actual device of one actor playing two roles was um, just absolutely fantastic. I, I've never been asked to do anything like that before. I'm sure there's been instances of it in, in the past in certain things, but it, it was just a great, in terms of an acting exercise, it was absolutely brilliant because you... Um, were given that challenge to uh, make the characters how different are they to one another and indeed how similar that are they because essentially it's one actor playing two roles so they are inexplicably <laughs> connected um and it was great i you know the modern day storyline with di Locke. i played him very earthy he's very alpha male um you know played it kind of straight and obviously when we go into 1955 everything becomes a bit more heightened as to what we've just discussed and it gives a, you a great opportunity just to lean into the comedic element of the character and yeah just to make it much more heightened and that's across the board i have to say the ensemble cast that they've assembled for this project is second to none you've got uh, Conleth Hill and all these amazing uh, actors, Pippa Haywood and, and Matthew Beard. And um, I have to say, I'm going to go out there and say it's one of the most talented and uh, brilliant ensembles I've had the pleasure to work with. And I think we all kind of really bonded over that device of playing two characters. Um, it gave it a great, it gives it a great um, theatricality to it. Mm -hmm. And um, and as I said, it just le it leapt off the page. And I think what Peter's done in, in his direction is just, I mean, ultimately with an adaptation, you want to, you know, do the best possible adaptation to the source material. And I think everybody across the board has certainly done that. Very proud to be part of it. Great. Well, um, and as you pointed out, yes, there is a theatricality, but both the, that 1950s, that throwback crime drama and the contemporary stuff continues to bring in fresh audiences. It's it's the one genre that is in just in no danger at all. Now, you've, as you alluded to, you have done your share of it, perhaps a little bit less violent than in some of your previous shows. Um, what would you, what is, <laughs> what is special about filming crime drama knowing that so many people will come to a show like this and will want to engage with the mystery and the twist. Well, I think everybody uh, loves a murder mystery. I mean, if you don't if you don't hook an audience by the end of that first episode in a murder mystery, it's kind of dead in the water, isn't it? But the great thing about Magpie Murders is what what we've been talking about is it's a, a who done it within a who done it, and so it's it's kind of like double bubble really. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's you kind of you can't help but get drawn into that. And you yourself as a viewer, you essentially be, you, you literally go on that journey with Susan Ryland, Leslie's character, because she, in, in effect, becomes the detective herself. So. Um, great. And when you get to the finale and when it sums up and all the clues fall into place, it, it, listen, it's just ingenious writing from Anthony. And uh, I think he's just at, absolutely smashed it out of the park with this particular piece there you go that's on the box set smashed it so um <laughs> yeah let's, as let's the go. kids say <laughs> <laughs> so peter um i mean as everyone's talked about it the great challenge of this show a mystery within a mystery 
but locations that needed to satisfy the needs of the story, both in the past and in the present. How do you go about creating that, filming it, making it work? Um, well, it was just a gift. Well, as soon as I read the first episode, I was like, in, you know, because for a director, it's just an absolute gift. You got a chance to make two movies or two TV series <laughs> at the same time, which kept me busy. But the, it was the transitions, which were already in that first episode, where we're in one world and we flip over to the other world. It was so cleverly written, and I thought there was potential to keep playing with that all the way through, which I had so much fun doing that. Um, and it was different for me. I've never, I've, my work has traditionally really just been get the director out of the way and just try and reflect reality as much as possible. So it's a kind of invisible hand that I've developed over the years. And I was just really hungry to do something where I wasn't invisible. Um, and where it's like directed clearly mm. and not can any... I just add something here can I just say that Peter is absolutely not invisible in our production <laughs> I mean his his hand is there it's all over it and um I'm, I'm I've never heard you say that that you, what the point you've just made about kind of getting out of the way so that everyone can just be real because um you know you 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 conducted us in such a in such a brilliant way. You know, you had it all in your head in the same way that Anthony and Jill have it all in their heads. And um, you know, so that that was great. I, I, I'm so glad that you got to flex your formidable you. directing muscles. And that's a terrible <laughs> story that you yeah, just told. What I mean is the style <laughs> of. I mean, I, my my sort of what I'm known for is kind of it's like reality, high, sort of reality that feels very real, very emotional, and funny. And hopefully that ha this has all this, but it's stylized. You know, it's got a one is completely like a sort of slightly heightened detective story, and even the real world and the publishing world. I wanted to make that a reality, but have this slightly elevated. Tone how how do you do that? that? How do you give it an extra? Well, it helps. Swirl. Having, I mean, the writing does it, and it helps yes. having Leslie in the middle of it. But the cinematography, even in the real world, is very wide. It's very open and airy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and and quite stylized. Uh -huh. I'm not being shy to have my, you know. <laughs> Mm. stylized montage sequences and and the music as well murray gold's music just adds yeah. a whole nother level of kind of genre mm. Um, mm. So, and the yeah. set and the set design as well yeah. I mean, mm. yeah and i think all, as well peter those editing decisions that you made as well with the cinematographer and your editor mm. the, the way that you do what we call those crossovers so smoothly and there's some really fun ones in there yes. you know we do we did we played with the sound as well a lot didn't we in those uh dubbing mixes where we use the editing of sound to cross over as well yeah, which was quite was interesting all, that scene where there's even scenes in the script where people are in once they're in a fictional scene and then they start to hear like the real world of susan like reading the book and they're like What's uh -huh. that? am i in a, <laughs> in a movie or something yeah so that, that's so that. nuanced i mean it is yeah, really authored in that way well, I was, I was in when I read that and I just thought, and people there along the way were asking me like, well, that, is that really going to work? And I thought, yeah, of course it works. So funny because it's acknowledging <laughs> they're, in, they're fictional. Um, mm -hmm. But, but yeah, what you've awesome. done with that opening sequence, I mean, that the opening minute or two, the editing is phenomenal. Yeah. And then you go into these amazing um, opening credit graphics, which just oh, serve it also yeah. brilliantly. The credit graphics are, I, I just the yeah. best. Oh, that it's yeah. I mean, it's so exciting. I don't think I've ever been so excited watching an opening two minutes before. You just, it's so, it's so gripping. Yeah, the duality was something to play. I mean, all the head of the department, from costume art department, and having two actors. But I knew we'd get a great. I mean, one, we already had Leslie. That was a big draw to come aboard. But I knew with the duality, I thought, well, I've got that's going to give me twice as much beef to get good actors. If if they were coming in just to be locked or just to be dubbed, <laughs> you wouldn't have Danny Mays playing it, but because you're getting dubbed here, <laughs> two parts. Um, Double bubble. Great kind of of actors, and I knew that <laughs> would just love, would love to play that game, you know. Um, and I just love the tone of it. It was really about trying to steer that, that playful tone, but give it a real heart as well. You know, I think Tim brings a lot of that to it. It's such a warm actor, and the character of Atticus is, he just gets this lovely tr tragedy and comedy um, and then having that other level of like knowing he's in a, he's in actually fictional the whole time um, is a great performance. So, yeah, it was really actually just fun every day. You know, I loved it. Yeah, very rich paint box. A lot to play with for sure. Yeah.
Um, and one of those things was locations. Now, um, um, you're, I'm guessing that you're among the best place to answer this. How, how did you find your locations? Did that come from the book or did you have to go in, in search of fresh fields and particularly the house, the beautiful house that had to serve both, both time scales? Well, I thought it's a story set that crosses cross cuts between Suffolk and London, contemporary, contemporary London and um, period Suffolk and some contemporary Suffolk. So let's shoot it in Dublin. Um, of course. <laughs> that, was like a given in the, that was a given when I signed on just for economic reasons really um, you know it's a, it's a more economical place to shoot and of course you know so with that so there's a complete mix up of Dublin real Suffolk for a bit and a tiny bit of real London just establishing shots and the cars driving around and the Liverpool Street Station yeah. um, so it was about just creating those two very distinctive worlds and trying to do Bloomsbury in Dublin, which was quite easy actually, because there's a lot of Edwardian mm. architecture in those mm. city squares. Um, and then we found that house, yeah, just outside of Dublin, um, which just served us so well and was so kind of slightly vulgar, you know. Um, <laughs> well, we looked at some beautiful houses. <laughs> Is that what you told the owner? You're just you're slightly vulgar for our purposes. <laughs> it's a it's a derelict uh, Guinness house. Yeah. That's yeah, it was, built, it was built as a party house, wasn't it? In yes. the, um, I can't remember when, the sort of late 19th, early 20th century, it was yeah. built as a kind of, yeah, yeah. And then of course it was place for them to let their hair down. And then is it going to have a tower was one of the big questions. Yeah. You know, the tower's the key part of the script, so. Of course it had a tower, didn't it, Peter? Yeah. That was a good when thing. I, when I turned the corner, it also had a tower. I was uh, couldn't believe it. <laughs> yeah. Did but I think really that, and also tell. we found the village of Kersey in Suffolk was a real turning point because to actually find a whole village where about 400 people lived, where they all agreed to let us film in the whole village, um, and some of them were in it as well, was a really massive turning point for the show. And it's an extraordinary um, uh, outcome. I, I think the village of Kersey in, in Suffolk. Oh yeah, they all so that so we had to get all the modern cars out and all the Range Rovers and everything off the street to do the period stuff. And we were like, are they are really everyone in the village going to cooperate? But they, the location department did a great job of charming everyone. And the, we were going to shoot in the pub, and the pub was sort of, we, we got in, in in with the pub and the church. And once we had those two on our side, it seemed to just spread <laughs> the whole the whole town. The two great pillars. Um, <laughs> So the only uh, yes, the you, only downside of shooting in Dublin was all the pubs were shut because of lockdown. That was the only you know all these amazing Irish pubs, but they were shut. Yeah, um, and and your quarantining, of course, guys, that you all had to do yes. a five day quarantining, which took a toll. Yeah, after you, a you while, have, did you it, referred it. a few a couple of times to the challenges of filming. Yeah. Was were these COVID? Uh, yes, yeah. and, and obviously the COVID was was, was difficult because also mm. you're flying people between uh, Dublin and and uh, the UK, flying whole crews to come across as well to film, but mm. also all the actors had to quarantine. I mean, everybody did. It was a very big commitment by everybody and very yeah, expensive we as well. Wine and cheese worked, you know, yeah. outside. <laughs> Well, yeah, nothing. Nothing. None of that. No. Nobody ambushed. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I think the um, as I had three five day chunks where I had to quarantine. I think it's the best thing that happened for the show because it. Boy, did I do some intricate shot list, storyboards, prep, <laughs> and um, I think that helped all those transitions and the kind of grammar of the piece. Gave, because often you're just always rushing around in prep, but I actually had time to think about those things. So um, it was quite quite good for me. But as Danny said. If any actor on this show doesn't know their lines, then they deserve to never work again because they all have five days. Have to wait yeah. five days. <laughs> We've got loads of I quarantine five days for one scene at one stage. Yeah. Well, the lovely Barry Cryer said he used to do the comedy for free and get paid for the transport. I guess it was that, wasn't it? Get, do the acting for free and get paid for the hassle. Um, I've just, I've got loads of lovely questions coming in, which I will get to, I promise. I've just got um, a question by, by the way, for both Anthony and Jill. Um, with, with, your, with this kind of material, plus your own track record, there are so many places, there wouldn't have been a, a broadcaster in Christendom that would have turned you down. What was the thinking with going to Britbox and working with them to get this onto their, their relatively new platform? Well, to, be, to begin with, actually, we did develop it with ITV. And then um, it was at a moment when they felt like they had a lot of other crime returning 
you know, and, and the schedule was busy. So, but also at the moment where Britbox was starting to make original drama, they, they were literally only made three and we're the fourth, I think. Mm -hmm. So we were, you know, I think what they really promised they would do with us is, is allow us creative freedom, you know, that we could really craft this show, that they would look after us and they, and they really did look after us. Mm -hmm. But also our primary broadcaster for this show is actually American. It's, it's PBS and WGBH. Right. So they were our principal broadcaster who commissioned the show and then, and then Britbox came on. So it was a, an unusual uh, way around, but we'd worked with PBS and WGBH on Falls War. Uh, so obviously 14 years of a relationship there, 29 films at Falls War. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we knew them very well and they, they loved our work. And of course they loved um, Anthony's writing. So they, they were really, really pivotal in, right. in all of the, the look and creative side of the show. Perfect. And I was going to ask you, will this get shown abroad as well? Because it does seem to be the lovely British quirkiness. Yes, I, I think, uh, you know, Sony are selling it worldwide. They have had a huge amount of interest in it mm -hmm. everywhere across the world. And right. they've only just started. So, yeah, it's exciting. Yes. It's promising. Um, okay, let's me let me go to um, the cues coming in. Um, so first one for you, Tim. Uh, somebody. Um, so Courtney has asked, did you do um, deep research into Holocaust survivor experience to get ready for such a role? Did that seem an integral part of what you needed to explore? Um, well, first of all, the the actor that I was trying to remember the name oh, of, yes. Anton Anton Walbrook. Um, so oh, uh, your your your, your question came up with an Anton, didn't they? Um, yes. Um, uh, no, in answer to, to that question, um, I didn't. I, I did. I came quite late onto the project, actually, and so um, didn't spend as much time doing sort of deep background um, research as I might otherwise have done. Um, but um, I, I sort of did a sort of little bit but I I sort of thought well what I really want to do is is um you know I don't want to um play too much background I want to just really concentrate on on the character um and um and his his interaction with with you know the people around him with uh with Chubb with with um Susan and um uh, and and you know the modern day, well not the modern day but the, the 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 day that he's living in so no i didn't okay i slightly but not a lot thank you uh one for you leslie um hmm. did you do you say you you base your character on emily Maitlis? did you, has she been in touch did you meet uh, with her to discuss yeah, I, you I, I, I didn't really base it on emily Maitlis, right. but i've always looked at emily Maitlis, and i saw her once at the bbc I was waiting to meet somebody. I was waiting in reception. And she kind of was running across the foyer, doing things, and and I I know what a you know I think she's one of those handful of brilliant, brilliant women that uh, uh, who are journalists and uh, that you know I I think they have fascinated by her mind and the way it works but I just watched her run across the reception and she looked fantastic she had an amazing outfit it was like 10 o'clock in the morning and she had high heels and the lot on and I just thought yeah that's really that's really interesting because I think you can you can form images of what you think somebody in that position should maybe be dressing like or and you can think about Susan Ryland and think, well maybe you know, she's a publisher and maybe she could be a bit plain. And, and I just thought, no, come on, let's, uh, let's, um, let's go a little bit Emily with her. So it's only those aspects of her. It's that, it's that mixture of style <laughs> and yeah. brilliant mind. Uh -huh. And I think Emily has got that. And so I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pinch that little bit of her and put Can that I? into Susan. Yes. And the, the second part of the question is, uh, and how would Susan have handled the Prince Andrew interview? <laughs> so I guess I can. <laughs> I'm not going there at all. No, no. Sorry. 
Um, one for you, Daniel, which is, uh, was the, oh, okay, well, you're going to have to be very discreet in how you answer this, I think. Well, for the ending to this crime drama, was this um, more satisfying, <laughs> less satisfying, equally satisfying, different than Line of Duty's finale? As the, as the well, uh, representative of all crime drama uh, on the panel, obviously. Well, that, that, that's easy to answer because I managed to get <laughs> through all six episodes of Magpie Murders as opposed to just one on Line of Duty. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm firmly in the uh, Magpie Murders camp for that okay. question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, Anthony, uh, one for you. David is asking, which do you prefer writing an original screenplay or a novel or adapting your own novel? God, that's difficult. I'm actually writing an original screenplay now for Jill Green again. Um, <laughs> I think I think probably adapting gives me the greatest pleasure because it, it's I'm I'm working with a known quantity. I mean, the book was already a bestseller and it had been a success in lots of different countries. So we had a good solid base, but it was also a base from which we could depart. You know, under Jill's guidance, who worked very closely with me on the scripts uh, in the early stages, realizing that we could so and we could create something completely new out of it and sort of go in a completely different direction was enormously satisfying. So if you like, I had both the joy of creating something new with the security and comfort of working with something that was already successful. The best of both. Indeed. Way, I see. And I wonder as well, how do you handle that process emotionally? Something that has been your little precious egg in a nest, and then obviously it becomes a much more collaborative process. Do you maintain complete control for Ikari, or do you surrender to, to the forces? Well, first of all, no. I mean, the, the writer shouldn't fight for control or hope for control or have control. You give it to the director, and in this case, because it was Peter Catania, I didn't have a single second of worry about it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I knew it was going to be good, though not, I have to say, as good as it has been. And um, in terms of my emotional connection with this TV series, it's odd because I was only able to see the actors and, and to go on the set very, very rarely. I mean, three or four times because, of course, of COVID, I was kept distant from it. And, and you know, all the socialising and the fun of shooting uh, was taken away largely, although we did manage, I think, to have one socially distant drink in the fresh air outside in Kersey um, along the way. But the funny thing is that I'm feeling quite moved, even as we're doing this Zoom, and I'm hoping that people listening can get the sort of sense of camaraderie that we all have about this show, because, you know, I feel incredibly close. It helped that I worked with Tim incidentally for, was it two seasons, Tim, on Foil's War? Our first outing together, um, and, and and I've admired many many of the actors who turned up, and and, as, and of course Peter too. Um, and and I can't think of a show in which I feel more emotionally and sort of personally involved than this one. Lovely, that's, that's going on the box as well. I think um, <laughs> with uh, the difference with this program from many others in your history is that they're all being released power thock together in in one throw versus the, the drip drop of a drama being released one episode per weekly. Does that, does that affect how you approach the structure? Does it change the writing in any way? Or is that very downstream of you? Well, the funny thing is I only saw it myself about our, in its actual finished form a few weeks or a month or so ago. And I watched it in one gulp. I mean, I just couldn't stop. And this is absolutely true. I went to bed at around, I'd seen three episodes, I think, and I went to bed at 11, woke up about an hour later, said, no, no, I would have watched more and just kept through the night watching <laughs> the, last, the last episodes. And um, it certainly doesn't make any difference to the writing of the show, no, because, you know, it was it is very, very carefully constructed in six mm -hmm. very obvious parts. You know, each part has a beginning and a, and a, and hopefully a really surprised come back and see more ending and that, that you build into it. But I think it is the, the way of modern on television that people who love a show now expect and hope and, and, and enjoy seeing it all in one go if that's what they want to do. I even wonder sometimes whether a modern audience, you know, has, with, we're all so busy, do we even have the capacity now to wait another whole week for a twisty story to continue? So, you know, good luck to people if they want to sit down and watch it all in one go. That's what I did. And I did it as well. I stayed up. <laughs> I started at like nine o'clock and thought, oh, well, I'll just watch a few. And then I, I didn't get to bed till half three. <laughs> I think in America, in America, they're going to be putting it out weekly, actually. Right. And I think they want to make even more of that. They really want audience to hold audience. So we've also made some little mini documentaries that sit after each episode and talk about uh, the, like, how murder mystery works the writing process, the, all the complications of, of this story. So there's the sort of extra, um, you know, bolt-ons, if you like, to, to keep the audience going week mm -hmm. by week. Yes. Um, 
yeah keep them there um yeah. so um there's one play for, for anthony from nicholas uh oh we've gone into bond bond world uh, is it time to reboot james bond in a 1950s setting like in the first Ian Fleming's and is that something that you would be up for if pressed? Beyond mentioning that I happen to have a James Bond novel coming out uh, oh. in May, um, which is set I think, no it's actually a little bit later in the 50s, uh, I'm going to just stick to Midsummer Murders, the Magpie, Magpie Murders <laughs> if you don't mind, I'm going to steer away from Bond. Um, uh, it will no doubt be enormously popular and the characters are so rich, there's so much scope to explore. Is, is there um, the prospect of a further series or more going forward? Absolutely. Moon, Moonflower Murders, Here We Come. It's already been brilliantly narrated uh, on audio by one Leslie Manville, as it happens. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and I'm, I am very, very hopeful. I mean, Jill's the person to answer this, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm waiting to get started. Jill? You're the We're just waiting one. for the transmission. Obviously, the first one has to go out. Yeah. On, on Brickbox but, uh, and PBS, but they're all very, they're both very excited, the financiers, and so we're really hoping. Um, and we have to wait for Leslie to become free. Uh, she yeah, has and I've told, and I've told Penny, I've told Penny about Jill as well. We've got to have, I've got to have Chubb and Lock again. And then, yes, hopefully um, sometime in 23, perhaps, I, I'm hoping. Yeah. Right. I mean, as you say, this isn't the first big, hopefully, that the beginning of a juggernaut. Can can you smell, difficult question, but in hindsight, you know, the, the, the likes of Foils War, Midsummer, can, is there a sweet smell? Is there a sweet spot that you feel you can almost identify now when you're in the midst of a project? Or is or does nobody know nothing in this industry? I, I think know when you, I, I think I think you when do you've got get, a good team. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, Leslie, you're going to say the same thing. Go yeah, on. go on, you go, Jill. I know, it's just you, you can sense it if you've got the right creative people around you. Yeah, honestly, mm -hmm. behind, in front of the camera and behind. Mm -hmm. the, 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 I mean, Anthony's right, the camaraderie, the closeness of this production, you could, you could feel it in the air. I don't know what, Leslie, what were, what were you going to say? Yes, well, that really, I think you do get a whiff of when things are going right, because I've sure as hell got a whiff of things being wrong in my career. <laughs> so um, uh, my antennae are finely tuned. <laughs> but when but, we, yeah, yeah. You, yeah. we could, I could, I could tell that we were doing something good, you know, that mm. we were, that we were, you know, hopefully onto a winner. And, and it was extraordinary, even on that personal level, given that, you know, I was in Dublin for um, two months, something like that. And, you know, we couldn't meet up at the weekends. We couldn't, we yeah. couldn't socialize together at all. So Monday to Friday was so busy, but the weekends were really quite lonesome. Um, and you couldn't <laughs> even, you weren't even allowed to drive five kilometers in Ireland. Um, so, so, but given that even, I think all the energy went into you're so happy to go to work because you got to see people and um but yeah beyond that it was um you, I, I could i could smell it was all good it was all rosy lovely feeling and daniel would you agree with that i mean you yes and tim as well you've both had your share of um well mo a lot of a string of hits do you think you can smell one from the beginning now uh, yeah, there's always something in the air, isn't there? And I think, you know, the, the, the actors that they assembled, the script that was there on the table and Peter at the helm, you, you know, you, it would go a long way to get it, get it wrong. But I think, like you said, the characters are so rich. There's a great playfulness in it. And it was, like Leslie said, it was an absolute joy to finally step out on set and actually film the scenes. Um, yeah, I think this has this whole world has great legs in it, and uh, long, long may it continue. Definitely, I'm, I'm rather pleased about that sequel idea there, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, doke. Well, um, thank you all for your time. To, oh, we have another. Better just sneak one in. Don't want to be, leave anyone out. Okay, Leslie, for you. Um, how was playing Susan compared with playing Princess Margaret, and who do you prefer? <laughs> <laughs> They're landing you with one, today, isn't it? Aren't they? <laughs> well, I, I think Princess Margaret would have liked to have been racing around in an open top red sports car. She was that kind of girl as well. Mm -hmm. I think the only difference between them, quite seriously, is that one of them's got a tiara and the other one hasn't. <laughs> 
that's that's probably a rule of thumb for many <laughs> characters isn't it? but it's all about the tiara great stuff well um thank you all for joining us today at the royal television society i just need to remind people tuning in that um so all of um I was going to say the, but no, but <laughs> of Magpie Murders is going out on Brickbox in one fell throw so on uh, the 10th of February, but this material from today is all embargoed until just this Sunday, the 6th. So I do hope you'll tune in and enjoy because I watched Light Leslie six in one big hit and uh, I didn't I didn't guess it I didn't see it coming so well done to everybody involved but um, that's all for today many thanks for joining all of you and to everyone tuning in thank you thank, thank you. you bye yep. bye, bye.